contribution is reflected in the increased status of vocational education in Utah, as well as in the exemplary facilities, which are now such a vital part of our outstanding educational system. J.L. Nelson has played a major role in designing these changes. He has been with the Utah Technical College, Salt Lake, since its inception as a Salt Lake Area Vocational School in 1947. He has been president since 1948 and is one of seven presidents of American colleges and universities with 25 or more years of service. He has witnessed the enrollment rise from 1,250 in 1948 to its present enrollment of 9,000. Through his persistent dedication, he has been instrumental in developing one of the finest vocational facilities in the country. A 1936 graduate of Brigham Young University in Accounting and Business Administration, President Nelson has continued his education at the University of Southern California, Utah State University, Ohio State University, and the University of Utah in educational administration and in industrial education. Just as those whom we are honoring tonight, he has devoted his life in the pursuit of quality and has been a fine example and leader to thousands of young people who have chosen vocational careers. Jay Nelson will be retiring August 31st of this year. He will be greatly missed. The impact he has made on our community will live forever. We feel honored tonight to have him as our guest speaker, President Jay Nelson. Thank you, Mr. Lawrence. After an introduction like that, I can hardly wait to hear what I have to say. <laughs> Governor, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, you've just learned of my impending retirement from Utah Technical College at Salt Lake. Since announcing my retirement, many people have asked me what I plan to do. Well, I just want you to know, old presidents never die. They just lose their faculties. <clears throat> <laughs> Not so long ago, I was in Atlanta, Georgia, attending a vocational education conference there. And I had the opportunity to visit a vocational technical school nearby. I promised the dean of instruction at the school that I would call him before I left Atlanta. And so, the morning I was scheduled to depart, I picked up the telephone, dialed the number. It surprised me when the operator's voice came on the line, and she said, that'll be 90 cents, please. Well, I was in a rather pert and a joking mood that morning, and so I said to her, 90 cents? In Utah, we can call Helen back for 90 cents. And she said, in Utah, that's a local number, sir. <clears throat> it's most significant that the chief executive officer of this great state continues to recognize the importance of skilled craftsmen and technicians in this modern-day world in which we live. They deserve to be in the spotlight and they certainly are in the spotlight tonight. I think we all enjoy being recognized. We like to be in the spotlight, unless, of course, the spotlight happens to be on the top of a police car. <clears throat> Not only is this banquet held, as you have learned, to honor these distinguished artisans, but also to identify some of the fine young men and women emerging from Utah high schools throughout the state who will soon be taking their place in the workforce of this great state of Utah. You know, when we come right down to the nub of the matter, the state's more, most important resource is not coal, oil, 
copper are precious metals, but rather successful, skilled craftsmen, technicians, and professional workers. One of the characteristics of a great craftsman is that he is very proud of what he's doing. <clears throat> an outstanding example of an individual who exemplified this characteristic is found in an incident from the life of Brigham Young, a writer who had great respect for titles, once wrote a letter to Brigham Young. He was hopeful of making an impression on the Mormon leader, and so he addressed the letter to him as follows. To His Excellency, Brigham Young, Governor of the Territory of the State of Deseret, Indian Agent of the Territory, President of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, when Governor Young received that letter, he didn't necessarily appreciate the pretense. But since his friend had used some of his titles, Governor Young thought that he should have used all of them. And so when they met some time later, Governor Young brought the matter up in their conversation, and he said to his friend, In your letter to me, you omitted one of my titles. And his friend said, Oh, do you mean the generalship governor? And he said, No. No, I mean Brigham Young, master cabinet maker, painter, and glazier. Well, his friend very apologetically said, The next time I write you, I'll include that with the other titles. And to this comment, Brigham Young responded, Omit the other titles. They are all the result of my being a master cabinet maker, painter, and glazier. Can you imagine a man achieving the distinction of becoming the governor of the state, Indian agent for the territory, and president of his church, saying, omit the other titles? They are all the result of my being a master cabinet maker, painter, and glazier. I sincerely hope that each one of us here tonight can be as proud of what we're doing as he was. Now, I am very confident, <clears throat> as I look over this audience this evening, that many of you own or operate your own businesses. And I am sure that others among you are planning to operate your business one day. And I would say that's a very admirable objective. However, the trouble with being self-employed is that it takes all the fun out of sneering at the management. <laughs> Well, occasionally, I think we've reached a new plateau in our communications. Someone has developed a sense of feeling for his fellow man. And that's what we refer to as empathy. About the best definition of empathy that I've ever heard is contained in the following incident. A plumber was trying to clean out some pipe. And he didn't know whether it was safe to use hydrochloric acid or not. And so someone suggested that he write a letter to the Department of Measurements in Washington, D.C. And he did. And he asked this very simple question. Is it safe to put hydrochloric acid in pipes? Well, after a reasonable length of time, he got back this long letter stating the efficacy of the method is undeniable, but the specific corrosive residue is incompatible in metallic permanence. Consequently, we would suggest an alternate method. Well, the plumber looked at that. He studied the letter. He read it over and over and over again. Finally, he took out his pencil and paper, and he sat down, and he wrote another letter. And he said, look, I'm sorry, but I don't understand. All I want to know, is it safe to put hydrochloric acid in pipes? Well, finally, after being kicked around back there in Washington, from one reviewer to another, some fellow got a hold of that letter who had complete empathy. And he wrote back to his plumber friend and he said, Don't do it, Mac. It'll eat hell out of the pipes. <laughs> Well, now, if we feel refreshed, 
and leave inspired tonight, I won't feel that our time has been spent in vain if we can develop empathy for one another. You know, in many respects, we live in a very unsettled world. I believe that we all recognize that society is beginning to realize that education and training programs need to relate more closely to the world of work. California's governor, Edmund J. Brown, made some significant comments in January when he was speaking to the California Apprenticeship Council in Sacramento. And he said, my concept is that many young people are sitting in classrooms learning things that are not taking them along the path we really want them to go in getting them into the mainstream of jobs where our society needs them. And Governor Brown added, apprenticeship can provide a very valuable on-the-job training experience, linking education, training, and income all together. At each preceding milestone in our lives, <clears throat> we have heard such comments as, graduation is the first step toward a greater goal, and education is a lifelong process. Well, these comments become more meaningful to me every day of my life. Life will become meaningful, and greater success will come your way if you continue to study and learn. And I'd like to invite each and every individual here to consider adding to your knowledge with evening educational opportunities. Every college and university in this state and most of the school districts provide extensive evening courses. I dare say that continuing one's education is essential because technology today is so complex that if we don't keep up, we're lost. And I'd like to encourage you to continue to pursue educational objectives regardless of your age. In fact, I'm here to testify that you'll be justly rewarded for each educational opportunity that you achieve. Please permit me to emphasize a philosophical point. Traditionally, <clears throat> post-secondary education has been expected to perform two roles. One, to produce a broadly educated person who understands the world and one's relationship to the world, and two, to prepare a person for life's work by providing a marketable skill. Now, I think we all agree that both of these roles are important. Universities seem to advocate that their responsibility is to teach individuals how to think and how to provide students with a broad general education. Vocational education, on the other hand, advocates providing skill training and only the supportive general education needed to perform the task. Perhaps there is need for a compromise in both areas. It's my opinion that a major thrust of the total system of education should be to prepare students for their life's work. I firmly believe that students should be steered into studies that will lead to employment. Now, obviously, I don't think that that should be the only thrust. We recognize that there's more to life than work, but we recognize, too, that there is really, truly no good life without a good job. The United States is a job-oriented society. Without a job, you're a nobody. The work ethic has made America great, and I feel a strong commitment to preserve and revitalize it among the younger generation. <clears throat> Things just don't happen. They're planned. <clears throat> Planning is actually the first principle of management. And to accomplish great things in life, we need a plan. You know, nothing is accomplished without planning and preparation. The spaceships which travel around the Earth to the moon and distant parts of the universe would not be leaving the ground if it were not for vision, planning, and preparation. 
Remember, things just don't happen. They're planned, and our success is contingent upon a plan and our desire to achieve it. It's your life. We all have our free agency, and we will make of it what we desire. Many years ago in Greece, there was a man who knew all the answers, and he was called the Oracle. In those days, as today, there were many young men and women who just didn't believe that Mr. Anthony knew all of the answers. One day, two young men were conversing, and one said to his friend, I'm going to prove to the oracle that he's wrong no matter what he says. And his friend said, hmm, how are you going to do that? And he said, I'm going to capture a small bird. And I'm going to the oracle, and I'll walk up to him, and I'll say, Mr. Oracle, tell me, is this bird that I hold in my hand dead, or is it alive? And if he says, it's dead, I'll open my hands, the bird will fly away, and he'll be wrong. If he says it's alive, I'll crush it, and again, he'll be wrong. His friend thought that was a good idea. So they captured the bird. Marched up to the oracle, and the spokesman said, Mr. Oracle, tell me, what do I hold in my hand? And the oracle actually could see a feather sticking out of the boy's fingers, and he heard the bird chirp. And he said, Why, my son, you have a bird in your hand. And the young man said, Yes, Mr. Oracle, I do have a bird in my hand, but tell me, is this bird dead or is it alive? And the wise old oracle, without hesitation, said, That depends upon you. Now, I'm confident that all of us want to succeed in life. We want our families, our friends, our relatives, and our business associates to look upon us with pride and admire our accomplishments. I'd like to give you a formula tonight that will help assure success. In Paul Dunn's book, entitled Anxiously Engaged, he tells about a retired business executive, a friend of his, who was asked the secret of his great success. And he replied <clears throat> that it could all be summed up in three words. And those three words are, and then some. I discovered at an early age, he said, that most of the differences between average people and top people can be explained in those three words. You see, the top people do what is expected of them, and then some. They are thoughtful and considerate of others, and then some. They meet their obligations fairly and squarely, and then some. They are good friends to their friends, and then some. And they can be counted on in an emergency, and then some. And so it is. When you have done what you've contracted to do, and then some, then your employer pays in full, and then some. Well, in summary, let me admonish you to continue your education. Education is a lifelong process. We hope that you'll be proud of what you're doing and attempt to excel in your craftsmanship. Success, of course, is achieved through planning, work, and dedication. And let me suggest to you that if you work for a man, in heaven's name work for him. Speak well of him and the company that he represents. Now, if you must growl, condemn, and eternally find fault, resign your position or your job, and when you're on the outside, then damn till your heart's content. But as long as you're part of the company, don't condemn it. If you do, the first high wind that comes along will blow you away, and probably you'll never know the reason why. Remember, an ounce of loyalty is worth a pound of cleverness. And for those choice thoughts, 
we owe to His Excellency Albert Hubbard. I have here this evening a very unique candle. I call it an eternal candle. It's eternal because it continues to burn until I extinguish it. This light <clears throat> represents the torch that guides the world. It's the beacon that guides you towards achievement and success. The light is symbolic of education. Occasionally, there are moments when the flame hesitates and seems to have died. Just as there are moments in life when our plans seem not to be progressing, but with confidence and patience, the flame continues to burn. And so will you continue to advance toward your objective if you're proud of what you're doing, if you plan, if you're enthusiastic, and if you're loyal. I admonish you to keep the desire for education alive. Who knows the limits of your capability? You may become an intellectual giant. We're very proud tonight of these award recipients. We look forward to future accomplishments of our scholarship winners, and certainly we all express our gratitude to our governor for making this evening possible. Thank you very much. In recognition of the outstanding and devoted service that President Nelson has rendered to the state of Utah over these many, many years, there is a small token of appreciation that we'd like the governor to present to him at this time. Jay, it's... Where are you, Jay? <laughs> it's my pleasure at this time, ladies and gentlemen, to present to President Jay Nelson a Governor's Vocational Craftsman Award. Let me hold it up so you can take a look at it. Congratulations and thank you very much, Jay. Thank you very much, Governor. <laughs> I've certainly admired these awards uh, over the past years, and Governor, this gives me an opportunity to make a speech I made once before when I announced my retirement to the State Board for Vocational Education. Sometime when you're feeling important, sometime when your ego's in bloom, sometime when you take it for granted that you're the best qualified in the room, sometime when you feel your resignation would leave an unfillable hole. Follow this simple instruction and see how it humbles your soul. Take a bucket, fill it with water, put your hand in it up to the wrist, pull it out, and the hole that's remaining is a measure of how you'll be missed. Now you can splash all you please when you enter. You can stir up the water galore, but stop and you'll find in a moment that it looks quite the same as before. Now, there's a moral in that quaint example. Always do the very best you can. Be proud of yourself, but remember, there is no indispensable woman or man. Thank you very much. <laughs>
Maurice Scallion, a calligrapher. And by the way, Mr. Scallion, uh, Mr. Scallion here did all of the um, beautiful hand lettering on all of the certificates which we're presenting tonight. This has almost become a, a lost art, and we're very proud of he and his work. Ken Selene, mechanic. Charles Simpson, elect electronic technician. Mm -hmm. 
Dale Streeter, Brick Mason. Gilbert Valesqui, maintenance mechanic. Lloyd Vidal, asbestos worker. Floyd Zemlock, underground coal mine electrician. Would Floyd raise his hand, please? Are we getting them mixed up? Yeah. Floyd has received his, and that's the last name we called. Let's give them all a big hand, please. 